put in our letter to President Trump. Um, the Everglades and Lake Okeechobee watershed include 19 counties and 163 cities. It has a $2 trillion economic impact on the state. It supports 55% of all the real property value in the state of Florida. For every dollar invested in the Okeechobee Everglades uh, restoration, it returns $4 of economic benefit. Due to a century of human development, the greater Everglades ecosystem is now, said is now less than half of its original size. And what you may not know is it fills up six times faster than it can drain, which gets into the nature of the complex series of projects. It results in massive discharges in the adjacent bridges, bridges and coastal areas. And since they're untreated, they, and they impact the uh, delicate uh, balance of fresh and saline water, as Chair Rashad mentioned. We, we went from uh, 3,000 cubic feet a second during the rainy time last summer down to less than 700 cubic feet a second right now coming out of uh, Franklin Lock. We need we need uh, fresh water now just like we needed uh, no fresh water back during the summer. So the SERP, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, uh, is designed to restore the balance like, like Matt talked about. Uh, it was created by Congress in 2000. Clinton and Jeb Bush signed it together. It includes 68 projects which will create storage, treatment and flow of water south into uh, the Everglades and Florida Bay. Storage and treatment of water entering Lake Okeechobee through the de-channelized Kissimmee and the uh, projects at the Nicodemus Slough and the Fish Eating Creek, as Matt mentioned. And uh, lastly, balancing these flows of fresh and saline water between the wet and dry years. So there's all kinds of bad stuff that happens when there's too much salt water and mangroves, bad stuff that happens when there's too much fresh water. And, uh, Unfortunately, God made the estuaries that neither one can live with each other. Uh, the SERP was set up to share the cost between the state and the federal government, as Matt said, 50-50. So far, the state's made $2.16 billion of investment in the watershed restoration, and the feds have made an investment of $1.26 billion. So that's that billion dollars that, that Matt mentioned. So instead of 50-50, we're 67 state, 37 feds. Uh, in fiscal year 2010, they appropriated $120 million for the SERP. Last year, they appropriated $70 million for the SERP. <coughs> it's never going to get there if we don't have some kind of paradigm shift. I'll mention a few of the projects that are still out there. Uh, these are from the Florida Water Resources Development Act 2007 bill. Okay? That goes back that far when they were authorized, and they're still incomplete. They involve projects on all sides of the lake. One is a site one in Impound Canal next to the Loxahatchee Wildlife Refuge over near Palm Beach. It has a combined cost of $164 million, and the state's put in nine, and the feds have put in 75, so it's 51% funded. The Picayune Strand in Collier County is projected total cost of $622 million. The state's put in 184, uh, and the feds have put in 327, so that's 82% funded. That's the one I'll get to in a second about the rest of it. Indian River uh, Lagoon, which is the C44 uh, C44 Canal at St. Lucie, has a projected cost of $3.985 billion. The state expenditure so far is almost $700 million, and the feds are $200 million. So it's 22% funded. These, these projects go back to 2007. Okay? Now, 2014, remaining incomplete projects from the Water Bill of 2014 is the C43 which is about a billion dollars. And this is the one that the state of Florida, through Legacy Florida, has just kept moving. They bought the land, now they're just gonna keep moving on building the project, and the Corps probably won't participate in this one at all, except for maybe operations and maintenance. Uh, so we're gonna get the feds to use their money to catch up on something else. Uh, it's 16% funded, so it's gonna use a lot of Legacy Florida money. Uh, the C-111 Spreader Canal on the east side of the Everglades that uh, Matt mentioned west of Miami that's key to moving water into Florida Bay. It's a combined cost of 140 million, and uh, the feds have put in uh, the states put in 49 million, and the feds have only put in 12, so it's 44 percent. Broward County Water Preserve is a little over one billion dollar price tag. The states put in 263 million, and the feds have only put in 54. It's 29 percent. And then lastly, the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands is 218 million dollar project that the states put 125 million in and the feds have only put 14, so that's 64% bill total. And then recent, for that, that, the total of all those bills, going back to 2007, is $7.2 billion of projects, and the uh, feds have put in 30%, a little over $2 billion. 
So we have our work cut out for us. Um, the recent word of Bill in 2016, which was highly publicized, that uh, uh, adds a new thing. It adds the, uh, uh, the SEP, the Comprehensive Everglades Planning Project, which was included <coughs> in the original SERP, but it was one of the few things that was never originally authorized. One of the things it combines is to, to redirect up to 200,000 or 210,000 acre feet uh, of, uh, of uh, water uh, discharges uh, into storage treatment and, and, and recovery basins that can be cleaned up and sent down into those water conservation areas that on the map that Matt showed and ultimately into the park, through the bridge, into the park, down in Farm Bay. Uh, this project will uh, reduce the damaging fresh water releases from Lake Okeechobee and the uh, Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie estuaries. The SEP includes a lot of features. It includes backfilling canals, because there's a lot of canals down there that impede the flow of the water south, uh, just like the canals that Matt alluded to uh, where the Tamarack Trail went south. That doesn't do any good to have a water conservation area that can't get the water down to it. Um, it also includes removal of uh, some roads and construction of the uh, 15,000 acre A2 flow equalization basin, uh, which is right next to the A1 flow equalization basin, which was built under restoration strategies. This will provide uh, 60,000 acre feet of, of storage, treatment, and ultimate conveyance uh, space. I've been taking pictures of A1 and A2 around to all the congressmen showing them, this is what your money bought you. This is what your money can buy you. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, I gotta get better, see how I get it. So anyway, my goal is to work with the Corps to move up their planning timeline so that A2 uh, can be built when the lease, the state of Florida lease expires in 2019 instead of some 2024, which is on the IDS that Matt showed. It's one of those projects down there where you have the red arrow, the, uh, EAA and DCOM projects. Um, Word also included 133 million to uh, uh, restore. The, oh, I meant to, I meant to say that is uh, that is almost two billion dollars to do to do A2 and removing all the levees and everything. And uh, and then it also had 133 million to finish the Picayune Strand in Collier County. Uh, that ultimately the Picayune Strand will be 55,000 acre feet of uh, drain newly drainable wetland. To, to, to have clean water going down into the western part of Florida Bay, which is the other side of that ridge that, that Matt mentioned. Um, so with all these projects, you know, we, we have our work cut out for us. We need to remember that, as Matt said, the state buys the land and the feds build the projects. The feds have zero interest in what happens in the acquisition of land. We don't have a dog in that hunt. But we do have a huge dog in the hunt to fund the feds with the state of Florida to get built on that land that you buy. And that's that's where we are. I've been having a lot of meetings with the key chairman of the House Appropriations Committee and the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, there's a guy named Mike Simpson, who's chairman of the Energy and Water Development Subcommittee. He's from Idaho. He's been there a long time. I met with him twice. I'm gonna get him down here to see the Everglades. And we're gonna put on the best Florida hospitality deal we can do, okay? Uh, he's from Idaho. In his office is a 10 foot long mural of the Grand Tetons. So I go over there with my picture of the Everglades and it looks like a wet wheat field. <laughs> and he says, that's the Everglades. I said, yep, that's the Everglades. You gotta come down and see it. You gotta see the birds on it, the snakes in it, and all that kind of stuff to really appreciate what it is. But I said to us, our Everglades are just as important as your Tetons. And so hopefully that resonates just a little bit anyway. Uh, the chairman of the Interior uh, and Environment Appropriations Committee, Ken Calvert, is going to come down. He's uh, a really, he's very interested. In fact, we may get him down in March. We're working on the agenda for that now. Unfortunately, Interior's got a very small role to play in this. It's really a core of engineer's deal. Uh, but they do some things. They, they, they've been very involved in the Picayune Strand, and, and, and so we need to get everybody in the tent. And anybody that's on the Appropriations Committee is a target-rich environment for me. Uh, the Chairman of the Water Resources and Environment Subcommittee at TNI is a guy named Garrett Graves. He's from Louisiana. I know a lot about Louisiana. I do construction projects all over Louisiana. And, uh, and we have a lot of common friends. And so I've been working on him to come down and see the other place. And being from Louisiana, we have a lot of common uh, understanding of the water hydrology issues. The Atchafalaya River is a bridge like your bridge, but in, in a situation like our Everglades. It's a bridge over a swamp. It goes from Lafayette almost to Baton Rouge. That's what they should have done when they did the Tent Miami Trail, but they didn't. 
Uh, so I've invited all these guys to come down. <laughs> Calvert's underway. Last guy is Rodney uh, Freelinghausen, is the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And he's a really nice guy. I know his sister. She lives across the street from me. And uh, we're, we're going to get him down here. If we can get all these people down here, I'm, I'm really confident that we'll get a better reception. Of course, we've got to get a better reception because the bar is so low right now. <laughs> go back and look at those statistics. It's pretty pathetic. Um, so how, what, what have we been doing wrong? What can we do better? Well, I, I think we've not had a unified enough voice at the federal level. We've had people go in and talk to congressmen about things they don't do, like buy land. We've had people go in and talk to congressmen about uh, the Kissimmee, and then the South Water Projects, and then C-43, and they say, hey, what do you guys really want? You know, Marco Rubio testified last summer, he did, he did an op-ed last summer in the Tampa Bay Times, and he said, there are 49 other states competing vigorously for appropriated infrastructure money. And so we've got to have the most unified voice we can get. So any of y'all that want to weigh in in Washington, come meet some of these people, you're more than welcome. I want to have the biggest tent we can have. Just like building a construction project, it takes a big team. And uh, that, those are the main things I'm working on. Uh, I would say that uh, through Amendment 1, you know, the state's folk done more than its, its half. And uh, the state's basically doing C-43 itself. And I think part of C-44 is all state too. So you've got a couple of billion ahead of you without the feds. Uh, the last thing I might say is I, I did a, uh, I've also been working with the governor. Um, we met together at the time of Trump's inaugural, and we're gonna, we're kind of working together to have a common story to go to the Corps of Engineers. And Marco Rubio's on board too. We're gonna ask them for 500 million. They've never done more than 100 million. So this is gonna be a sea change for the Corps. Will we get 500 million? I don't know, I'm gonna be optimistic, but I doubt it. But we're gonna do the very best we can get, and we can certainly justify billions. And hopefully, by, by hitting a high number like that, and really making a strong case, and getting more people inside the tent, we can raise the bar and get on a steady funding, like a legacy Florida from the Fed side. I mean, I'd love to see a commitment that, okay, we're gonna do four or 500 million a year, I need them to catch up. And then we'll revert to doing what the state of Florida does, which is what it's intended to be with Jeb. Bill Clinton signed up. And so the last thing I did was I did this letter to Trump. Here's my letter. I did this letter to Trump and got the whole uh, Florida delegation to sign it up. Democrat and Republican. Enthusiastically, quite frankly. Okay? And, and they all get it now. And what we said to Trump was, in your inaugural speech, you talked about infrastructure. Well, we are the greatest infrastructure project there is going, okay? The other thing is, when he came down to uh, Collier County Fairgrounds in October, I introduced him. And he flew over the Everglades in his helicopter, and he talked all about the Everglades and how he was going to help get the money to restore it. So all the letter says is, hey, I'm put up, man. It's good. So glad to answer any questions anyone has. And Representative or Chairman Roshan, thank you for having me here. Matt, thank you for having me. Thank you, Congressman uh, Rooney, for that information and for that presentation and all those figures. Um, and thank you for your commitment. And with that, members, I'll open up the uh, floor for questions. Vice Chair Alfred, you're recognized. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a million for, for uh, maybe a couple billion. Thanks a couple billion. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, really appreciate it for sure. Uh, you know, thinking about the, the rehab of the dike, so could you comment any, or maybe Chair Caldwell may comment a little bit about what that is, and when you say rehab the dike, kind of the mechanical process of that is going on. I just find it to be interesting. Well, the problem was, as uh, Representative Fine and I know, when they <coughs> built dikes in the 20s, they did them with rubble and dirt. Now we build them with slurry walls. So the projects go around and put slurry walls so that the dike will be invincible and can handle the pressures to sustain higher lake levels that, uh, that, that Matt mentioned, that, that would be nice in like if Hurricane Matthew could go on 50 miles west, you know. Which, the Corps was talking about piercing the dike if Matthew had gone west. That would have been a drastic emergency measure. But so what they're gonna do is it's 140, if I get my numbers wrong, you tell me. It's 140 miles, I think it's $10 million a month to build that slurry wall. And, and what I talked to uh, Chairman Simpson about was um, with the Corps, was trying to, to speed it up. The core guys are good. The core guys said, well, we really can't speed it up because we can only get so many crews on the dock. I said, hold on, I built this kind of stuff all over the country in Central America. You can work two places at once. And so I've been, I, so I talked to Colonel Reynolds about it. I said, 
let's work two places at once. So the dike can be speeded up if we could get the money. The dike is 100% federal project. That's not even in these billions. But the good part about it is I think the Corps is really committed to doing the dike. Because the last thing the Corps wants to do is take out, you know, west side Fort Lauderdale. Recognize for follow-up. Okay, thank you. So thinking about the dike, right? Uh, I think the terminology they use maybe is curtain wall or slurry wall. Slurry wall. But they, I mean, what would that look like, right? So they are they laying it on the side? Are they? You, you dig down in it, put in the rebar, <coughs> build a big wall. Down through the, the center. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's, I'm not sure it's all in the center, it's all inside, but it's probably going to be in the center. Because they can't undermine what they got. It's either going to be the center or the back side. But what, the difference between a slurry wall and a regular wall is a slurry wall is poured against dirt rather than formed. Some of it will have to be formed, which, as the uh, representative notes, adds a lot of money to it. But the bottom line is you've got to have a con concrete reinforced structure to be able to, to really hold up. And you've got to put a foundation in there. You know, you got to go down first, dig way down, and put in a foundation. Anybody else down here? Good. Thank you, Congressman Ray. Can I make one comment about oh, the bridge? Of course, please. The bridge. The, the, uh, you got to do everything you got to do to build a seven mile bridge to do this bridge because there's a, it's, it doesn't seem like it when you're sitting right, driving, riding over it, but it's like Matt said, 10 feet deep and dry on the south side. And so uh, I think they're building it to the same standards as the Interstate Highway Bridge. That doesn't necessarily mean that the course got the best price. Okay. First, I'm fine. You recognize. But just two hundred million dollars for two and a half miles down. I mean, again, I, it was just a gut thing to me in my experience. It just sounds like a lot of money for a bridge that's you, you know. Again, it's not. They're not going ten stories up. They're just trying to let the water go underneath. Yeah, but it's basically about like the seven mile bridge or the Chapelot Bridge. So what we ought to do is find out maybe some similar bridges. I know that. Last time Kathleen and I drove back from uh, Pensacola, they were doing an add on to a bridge up by Soft Choppy. We'll find out what that would cost. We find out what that, there's a bridge north of Tampa that we saw. Get we'll FDOT to tell us, you know? Perhaps I'm fine. We can follow up with, with DOT. I'd, and, I'd be happy to. And get the, uh, the justification for that. Yeah. You never know with the core, not, not to be down on the core, because I'm up on the core. The core's my ally right now. But you don't know what operation, what other kind of overheads they might have cost over that number. There's all kinds of games played in the federal government about where the money's put. There's the probably no games here, but a lot of money is put there. The opportunity is get more money or get more with the money we have. I mean, and it just, it's that's a lot of money for a fairly short distance for a bridge that's not going to be elevated that far off the ground. We're just trying to let water pass underneath. Yeah, but as you know, once you get above the water, sure. it doesn't make that much difference how, how, how much more high you are. But the money spent getting you above that water. In fact, we used to say, I'd rather work in deep water or I'd rather work on dry land, but I don't like working in shallow, wet water. That's when bad things happen to cranes. It's, well, you know, it's a little harder. Oh, Representative Diamond, you're recognized. Thank you. Congressman, I just want to Thank you for your advocacy and efforts and um, trying to bring a unified voice on these issues to Washington. And I appreciate the idea that this is a, was originally thought of as a 50-50 relationship and, and you're working to see that relationship restored to that balance. And I just want to commend you for that. Um, I also had some questions, as Chairman Albrecht did, about the dike um, rehabilitation work. And, and since that's a federal project, um, uh, can you help me understand, there, there's been discussion about the relationship between the dike rehabilitation projects, which I know are ongoing and huge projects, I've seen them, and the um, estuary discharges that occurred last summer. What, what is the relationship there in your view? Well, the Corps is not going to let the lake go down about 15 feet because they're scared, maybe 15 and a half for a brief period. Uh, like last summer. I mean, we started the summer at like 13 or 14 feet or something. We knew it was going to be a disaster. You could tell, and you could tell a year ago. I mean, well, you could tell last February that we were going to have a disaster in the summer because it rained so much in February. And, and so when you start out that high, the rain's come, gets up to 15 feet, they're going to let the water out. I'm telling you, if Matthew had gone 30 miles west, they would have cut a hole in that dike. The, the, uh, the, the Taylor Slough would have looked like a culvert and put so much water on it. Well, they are not going to kill people. 
the flood control is the Corps' primary overriding mission. So we're trying to we're trying to fence around the side of their overriding mission to throw in environmental and a few other things to keep the balance. Thank you. Okay, is that a fair statement? We don't worry about this about it. We could take all day on these questions. Yeah, we really could. Mm -hmm. Representative Goodson, you recognize that question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Would you agree that working or bidding a Army Corps engineer job to build a bridge, to build an outhouse, to build a, a Wawa store, if the Corps is involved, is 20 to 30 percent more than building a normal Wawa house sign? Now look, this might get out on the internet like everything else in life, and of course my ally. <laughs> there are people who are going to give up that are going to execute the billions. But, you know, the, the, um, just like with departments of transportation, you know, there's some really good ones, and Florida's one of them, and there's some really bad ones. There's union issues. There's Davis-Bacon that applies to federal projects, which I would love to repeal. And I asked, how could I do that? And they said, well, you can't. <laughs> they said, you can introduce a bill. They didn't go anywhere. This was Republicans telling me. I don't know which side of you all are Democrats or Republicans. It doesn't really matter. We're all united trying to get money from the Everglades. But uh, uh, with things like Davis Bacon and Walsh Healy, runs up the price of construction. Um, what else does? No? They have a pretty good procurement process now, actually. They, we do a lot of core work. They used to do all hard bids, and people put a lot of money in there as a contingency. Not very many people would work for the Corps, so you got inefficient pricing. Now they're much more uh, uh, balanced in the way they procure. They take uh, best best uh, uh, best uh, price in a kind of a, they call it a qualifications proposal, and they compare them. And they'll pick the they'll try to match the best qualifications and, and the best price, and try to get those two pulled together. But they will uh, result get some of the contingencies out of their bids. You recognize. I really don't know how you answered that, but I'm all with you. <laughs> that was your follow-up? Okay. That was it. Excellent. Excellent. Any other questions, members? Well, thank you again, Congressman. Thank you, Chairman Rasha.